Um, good evening and uh, welcome to this distinguished speaker event here at the uh, Side Business School in Oxford. Uh, we have people dialing in as well, so welcome to you uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Rupert Younger. I'm director of the Oxford University Centre for Corporate Reputation here at the Business School. And I have the pleasure and honour to have uh, been introduced to Bill through mutual friends a few years ago um, and have nominated Bill to become a visiting fellow here at the University of Oxford, a position which was granted to him last year by the Chancellor of the University of Oxford, Lord Patton of Barnes. Bill was the largest foreign investor in Russia until 2005, when he was suddenly denied entry into the country and declared a threat to national security for exposing corruption in Russian state-owned companies. Over the last 15 years, Bill has become a persistent critic of the Putin regime. The story that we're going to hear today is as compelling as it is shocking. It's a story of a human transition that saw Bill morph from financier to human rights campaigner, seeking justice for the murder of his friend and lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky. It's a story of legal intrigue, uh, pitting one man against, and sometimes with, state and legal corporate legal powerhouses. It's a story that covers the sweep of global geopolitics, demonstrating the power of professional and political networks, both for good and for bad. But perhaps above all, it's an intensely personal story of extraordinary perseverance, integrity, hope, and belief in the idea that the truth will out, no matter what sort of fakery tries to hide it all. I'm delighted that Bill's wife, Maria, and daughter, Sophie, and son, Joshua, are here also tonight. Uh, and I'm also delighted to welcome alongside Bill uh, two of our current MBA students, uh, Malvika Gaikwad and Sierra Bates, who will lead the discussion with Bill after he speaks. Malvika is, a, uh, is the Oxford Intesa San Paolo Scholar and a Forte Fellow here at the Business School and a co-founder and co-CEO of The Organic Carbon, a company that promotes sustainable, regenerative uh, organic farming practices using traditional wisdom and modern technologies. Sierra uh, is co-chair of the Oxford Women in Leadership Alliance and is a neuroscientist who's come to Oxford with a passion to develop new insights into how building scalable health tech solutions for large and small companies alike can be achieved. Bill will speak for around 30 minutes, following which Malvika and Sierra will lead off the question and answer session. I will be collecting questions from the large number of people joining us online, and we'll add these to the wider Q&A that we will open up with all of you. So please do come armed to ask whatever you would like Bill to answer. In our conversation before, he said, uh, don't worry about running through any questions because he will answer anything that anyone throws at him. There you go. Open invitation. Please feel... <laughs> Please feel free to ask whatever you would like. Um, I'll do my best to get as many questions uh, answered as we can manage in the time. Uh, we plan to finish by 7.15, uh, following which you're all warmly welcome uh, to join us for drinks in the foyer outside. So with that, let's get started and Bill, over to you. Well, Rupert, thank you for inviting me here, and thank you for inviting me to be associated with uh, Oxford as a visiting fellow. This is my first visit here um, as a visiting fellow, and I'm delighted to be here, so um, it's, um, it's great to be here. Um, <clears throat> the one thing that um, Rupert didn't mention uh, is uh, I'm also an author, and um, uh, I've written two books. Uh, one of them is called Red Notice. Um, in my first book, Red Notice, um, was was a, um, uh, a a book about the sort of ar ar the original arc of my career, um, coming from business school like many of you, and going to Russia when the Soviet Union uh, ended, um, setting up an investment fund, ma a major business success story, and then uh, all the terrible things that happened afterwards, which I'm going to talk about uh, tonight. 
Um, generally, when a person um, from finance writes a book, um, it's usually really boring. <laughs> and, um, uh, and definitely not successful. And so the fact that my first book, um, Red Notice, was a bestseller, um, it's, it totally surprised me. And, and, and it was, I guess, almost unprecedented. I think the only other um, really widely um, read finance book was Liar's Poker by Michael Lewis. But generally, finance books don't make it into the mainstream. And, and it's kind of a, it was kind of a, um, like a, such a low probability event, like light, lightning striking, um, that I, I thought, um, one and done, I'm not going to write any more books. Uh, that was successful. People got to hear my story. They got to hear about my lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, which I'm going to talk about today. That's the end of the story. Um, and then all sorts of really shocking things happened um, in my relationship with Russia after the book had been finished. Many, many things. And I thought, I really need to document all these things in a second book. Um, but I was really reluctant to start the second book because the probability of my first book being successful was so low that I didn't think that there was any chance that a second book would be successful, but I, but I had to write it. And so in July of 2018, um, I started to write my second book. And um, I live in the UK. Um, uh, this is my, the, where I've been living for 35 years, but I have a home in Colorado, in Aspen. And I was in Aspen um, uh, to, for my summer vacation, beginning to write this book. And it was, um, I, it was one of my first days for the vacation. I um, set up at the dining room table. I took my computer out. I told my children, don't come anywhere near the dining room until lunchtime. Uh, I turned off the internet off of my computer so I didn't get any, any messages. Uh, I put my phone on silent face down and I started to write. And there's nothing more intimidating than, than having a um, blank page um, when you're starting to write a book. And I typed a few paragraphs. And um, uh, uh, I read them, and they were terrible. <laughs> I erased them. Uh, I typed a few more. They were terrible. I stared out the window in the mountains, um, which looked nice and helped distract me. And um, uh, twiddled my thumbs, and eventually I couldn't take it any longer. I turned my phone over to see what was going on um, in this hour that I had written nothing. And there were 176 new messages on my phone during that hour. And the first one read, Bill, are you watching Helsinki? Um, the second message read, um, if you need a place to hide out, you can use my cabin in the mountains. And, and what all these messages were referring to was that at that very moment that I was starting this book, Trump was meeting with Putin in Helsinki, Finland, in the very first um, summit between the two presidents. And the, the, the summit was taking place on a Monday morning. And on the previous Friday, um, special counsel Robert Mueller, the person who was investigating um, Russian collusion in the US political process, had indicted 12 Russian GRU officers. And so the obvious question for the summit, uh, for Putin, is, um, are you going to hand over these 12 GRU officers? So um, the, the two presidents have their summit. It was a secret summit, the first time ever um, between Russia and the United States. There were no witnesses, no aides, no national security advisors, no secretaries of state, just the two presidents. They emerge from their secret summit. They come out to the um, uh, press conference. Putin is strutting out like he owns the place. Trump is a bit hunched over like this. And they start the press conference. And as one would have expected, three questions in, the Reuters correspondent raises his hand and says, directs the question to, uh, to Putin, Mr. President, are you planning on handing over the 12 GRU officers? Putin smiled. He obviously knew that this question was coming. And he said, yes, it's entirely possible that we would. But if we did, we would expect some goodwill and reciprocity from our American friends. And specifically, we'd expect them to hand over Bill Browder, me. <laughs> well, that was very unpleasant. <laughs> um, uh, it was definitely unpleasant, but it wasn't surprising. So ever since uh, the Putin regime 
murdered my lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, and I got the Magnitsky Act passed, which imposes sanctions um, on Russian human rights violators and kleptocrats. Um, Putin, who is a human rights violator and a kleptocrat, who has a lot of money offshore, um, has been on a mission to destroy me. Um, uh, he's issued eight Interpol arrest warrants for me, death threats, kidnapping threats, lawsuits, extradition requests, every nastiness you could ever imagine has been directed from Putin towards me. And this is, um, and, I, and I've been a regular topic of conversation. And it's very interesting because Putin doesn't normally mention the names of his enemies. They don't usually get names. But he mentioned my name on regular, uh, regular occasions ever since the Magnitsky Act was passed. And so it was unpleasant, but not surprising to hear my name mentioned at this summit. Um, but what was surprising was what happened next. So the obvious question was then directed to, to President Trump. You know, Mr. President, what do you think about Putin's offer? And without skipping a beat, Trump said, I think it's an incredible offer. <laughs> <laughs> to have the most powerful man in the free world agreeing to hand me over to a murderous dictator who wants to kill me, that was very surprising. And then I had this worry. I was sitting in the United States. I normally live in the UK. I'm actually a British citizen. Um, but I was in the United States. I was under his jurisdiction. And, um, and so I was, so the summit then breaks up. Um, the two presidents go their separate ways. Um, and overnight, Putin realizes that he's made a terrible mistake. Um, he considers himself the most ruthless negotiator out there. Um, and the Americans had asked for 12, and he'd only asked for one. And, and that really burned him up all night, and he couldn't, couldn't uh, sleep properly. And so the next morning, he announced 11 more people he wanted to hand over. <laughs> he wanted the former US ambassador to Russia, Mike McFall, who's a friend of mine and helped me with the Magnitsky Act. He wanted Kyle Parker, who was the um, chief of staff of the congressional committee that wrote the Magnitsky Act. He wanted three agents from the Department of Homeland Security who were investigating the Magnitsky case. Basically, everybody on his list <clears throat> had two basic common denominators. They were, one, <clears throat> they were people who helped me with the Magnitsky justice campaign, and two, they were associated with the US government, either being current or former officials. So it's one thing to ask for a private citizen to be handed over and to, to agree for that person to be handed over as Trump did. But it's another thing entirely um, to hand over officials from the US government for doing the work for the US government. Who would ever go to work for the US government if you do policy in one administration and then the next administration will offer to hand you over to a hostile foreign regime? And so I, I was sure that whatever Trump's feelings were about me, that he would push back very strongly on this revised deal that Putin was putting forward. But one day went by, total silence. Two days go by, total silence, three days. On day four, <clears throat> I am, uh, I'm, on a inter uh, I'm doing a, a TV interview. And in the middle of the TV interview, they say, um, uh, there's a press conference going on at the White House. We're going to stop the interview here, stay on the line, we're going to go to the White House. And so I could hear the press conference taking place in the White House. It was Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Remember her? She was the press spokesperson for Trump. And, um, and so the three questions in Maggie Haberman from the New York Times raises her hand and says, um, uh, is President Trump going to hand over Bill Browder, Ambassador McFaul, and the 10 others that Putin asked for? And this was her moment to push back hard to say, of course not, that's ridiculous. Um, but she didn't say that. She said, the president is considering his options. He's consulting his advisors. We will let you know. So at this point, there's a, all hell breaks loose in Washington. And the Senate decides that they're going to have a vote the next day on whether to hand us over or not. The vote is taking place at 4.30 the next day. And over the, the, as the day starts, all sorts of senators start issuing tweets and press releases and statements on their websites 
saying how outrageous this was. And this was not a partisan issue at all. Democrats, Republicans, everybody thought it was outrageous. And as the number of tweets and press statements and, and, and other press releases and so on starts um, piling up, uh, at about 3.30 that day, the White House realizes that they've really walked into a terrible political mess. And they quietly issue a statement saying, well, we understand that Putin's uh, desires were sincere. We're going to be unable to honor his request at this time. An hour later, at 4.30, the Senate voted 98 to 0 not to hand us over. And uh, that's why I'm so pleased to be here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> so how did I get into this mess? The, um, uh, I'm going to take you through the story quickly. Um, uh, I come from an unusual family background. Um, my grandfather was the general secretary of the American Communist Party from 1932 to 1945. Um, he uh, ran for president twice as a communist in 36 and 40 against Roosevelt. Um, he was imprisoned by Roosevelt um, in 41, pardoned in 42. He was expelled from the Communist Party in 1945 for being too much of a capitalist. Um, and then he was um, uh, persecuted viciously during the um, uh, McCarthy era. So this is my family legacy. I was born in 1964, I'm 59 years old. When I was going through my teenage rebellion in the 1970s, I was trying to figure out the best way of rebelling from this family of communists. And I came up with a perfect plan, which was to put on a suit and tie and become a capitalist. Um, and that really uh, did the trick. Um, I became a capitalist, and I ended up at Stanford Business School in 1987. Um, and I graduated Stanford in 1989. And 1989 was a very auspicious year because that was the year that the Berlin Wall came down. And as I was trying to figure out what to do with my career, um, I had an epiphany, which is that if the Berlin Wall has just come down and my grandfather um, was the biggest communist in America, um, I'm going to try to become the biggest capitalist in Eastern Europe. <laughs> and so that's what I set out to do. And I had several jobs. I, I couldn't get all the way to Eastern Europe from California, so I moved to London, had several jobs. But the job that pretty much defined the rest of my uh, career since then was a job at Solomon Brothers. Solomon Brothers doesn't exist anymore. It's part of Citigroup now, but um, it was a real swashbuckling investment bank back then. And I got a job on the Eastern European investment banking team at Solomon Brothers. And my very first assignment on the East European investment banking team was to advise a fishing fleet in Murmansk, Russia, on their privatization. And so I, go, I fly to Murmansk. The uh, head of the fishing fleet meets me at the airport. And he wants to take me down to the docks so I can see one of their ships um, before we start our business meetings. And so he takes me to the dock. And I see this enormous ship. It's like 400 feet long. It's got five different stories. There's the the story where they catch the fish with the nets, then they separate the fish and all this kind of stuff all the way down until they can the fish in the lowest level of the ship. Very impressive operation. It's like an ocean-going fish factory. And I um, ask him, how much does one of these things cost? New. And he says, $20 million. How many do you have in your fleet? 100. So I multiply 20 million times uh, 100. It's 2 billion. What's the age of your fleet? Uh, seven years. I didn't know anything about uh, fishing or ships, but I figure that make, makes it half depreciated. So a billion dollars worth of ships. And I've been hired um, by this, or I should say Solomon Brothers have been hired by this um, fishing fleet, by the management of this fishing fleet, to answer a simple question, whether or not the management should exercise their legitimate right under the privatization program of Russia to buy 51% of the company. And so I ask him, at what price is the government selling 51% of the company? And he said, two and a half million dollars. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to be a, a Solomon Brothers banker or a Stanford MBA to know that, that billion dollars worth of ships, 51% um, for two and a half million dollars is a pretty good deal. And, um, I, I realized at that moment in time that I didn't want to be advising on this stuff. I wanted to be investing in this stuff. <laughs> so 
So um, eventually, I left Solomon Brothers. Um, I moved to Moscow, and I set up an investment fund called the Hermitage Fund. I started it with $25 million of seed capital from a, a famous investor named Edmund Safra. And I had the most spectacular launch of an investment fund in the history of investment funds. Over the first um, 18 months, my fund went up 865%. I was the best performing fund manager in the world in 1997. I, um, uh, I went from $25 million of assets under management to a billion, which now doesn't sound like a lot of money, but back then it was all the money in the world, particularly in Russia. Um, I was featured in the uh, business section of the New York Times, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal as some kind of new modern financial genius. Um, my clients were sending their private jets to Moscow to ferry me back to the south of France to toast my success on their yachts. Um, and I was all of 31 years old. Now, um, any of these great things would have, these accomplishments would have been great accomplishments um, in their own right, separately. But you put them all together, and then you put them all together into the hands of a 31-year-old, and that's the biggest sell signal there ever was. No offense to any 31-year-olds here. Um, I, 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 I thought everything was going to go to the sky. Um, instead, um, uh, it didn't quite work out that way. In 1998, um, the Russian stock market, well, I should say the Russians defaulted on their, on their debt, um, their domestic debt. They devalued their currency by 75%. And um, uh, my billion-dollar portfolio went down 90%. I lost $900 million of my client's money. Uh, needless to say, there was no longer any invitations to anyone's yachts. Um, but, but more, for, uh, and, and I, for me, the, the really sort of horrible part about this was that I had gone around trying to convince people to invest in Russia. Um, most people said no. And occasionally, someone said yes. And all those very you know, small number of people out of the large number that I tried to recruit who said yes, I had lost 90% of their money. I was really deeply ashamed. Uh, and I really wanted to get their money back for them. And in theory, it, it shouldn't have been that hard. Because when you're in, investing in a country that is an export-oriented country, which Russia is, and I owned oil companies and aluminum companies and things like that, the exports maintained their value in dollars, and the costs were in rubles that had just gone down by 75%. And so if your revenues are the same and, and your costs have just gone down, your profits um, increase exponentially. And so I thought to myself, I just need to wait it out, and the profits will bring the stock prices back. Um, well, that was the theory. The problem was that all the companies that I was investing in were majority owned by these people known as the Russian oligarchs. And the Russian oligarchs are not nice people. And the Russian oligarchs had, up until that point, kind of behaved themselves. They thought if they didn't scandalize their minority shareholders that they could get some free money from Wall Street. But after this collapse and devaluation, it didn't matter whether you were a good oligarch or a bad oligarch. No one was going to give you any money anywhere. Russian assets of all sorts were like radioactive waste, and nobody wanted to touch them. And the oligarchs thought, well, if, there's no, if the markets are closed on Wall Street, um, there's no incentive to behave. And in Russia, there's never been any disincentive against misbehavior. And so the oligarchs embarked on an orgy of stealing, which has been unprecedented in the history of business. They were doing asset stripping, transfer pricing, dilutions, embezzlement. And they're doing it on an industrial scale. And there I was. I was sitting with the last 10 cents on the dollar, desperately trying to get my clients out of this hole that I put them in. And these oligarchs were going to try to steal the last 10 cents I had. And so I decided, not because it was a good investment strategy, but, but because it was the only survival strategy, to try to fight them, to stop them from stealing. Well, how do you stop a Russian oligarch from stealing? You can't go to the um, government and say, uh, this oligarch is stealing from me, please regulate them, because the government officials are on the payroll. You can't go to the police. You can't go to the courts. Um, you pretty much have nobody to go to. But the one thing I did have was an ability to actually figure out how they were doing the stealing. I had a really good team of researchers. 
And I knew all the Western journalists in Moscow. And so we, we, what I decided to do, which was the only thing I could do, was to do a stealing analysis of Russian companies. Um, and we, do, we would do these stealing analysis. And you'd think, well, how do you do a stealing analysis of a, of a Russian company? Isn't it a, a very opaque place? Russia is actually one of the most transparent places in the world for a reason that you would not expect. It's the most bureaucratic country in the world. Um, they collect information on everything in every different ministry. And the people who work in these ministries put this information up for sale for almost no money. So if I was having a meeting with any of you and we were in Russia, I could buy a disk which would tell me what your bank balance was. I could find out your travel records. I could find out who you've called on your mobile phone. Um, everything, there's no data protection. Everything is for sale for a small amount of money. And so we started buying these disks um, and analyzing who was doing what to whom. And we found out unbelievable, shocking things. And then I would take these shocking things and I would share them with the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times. And it was very interesting that, I mean, that could have been the end of the story that like, nothing would have happened. But at the same time that I was publicizing all these scandals in the Russian companies that I was investing in, was a time that Vladimir Putin had just come to power. And Vladimir Putin, at that time, wasn't this all-powerful tyrant that he is right now. Vladimir Putin was all the power that he had, that the presidency should have had, had been informally stolen by these oligarchs. And there is an expression, your enemy's enemy is your friend. And in this particular situation, these oligarchs were stealing power from him, and they were stealing money from me. And so every time that I would publish one of these scandals, he would step in. And I've never met the guy. I haven't met him then, and I haven't met him since then. But he would step in um, and go after these oligarchs using whatever power he had. And he would... If, if the state had a majority share in a company, he would fire the CEO or he'd issue a presidential decree or do various other things. And as a result, every time I would put one of these scandals out there, he would step in and the share price would go up. And it was just crazy. So, so at the bottom of the market, um, I was managing $100 million. So it went up from $25 million to a billion, down 90% to $100 million. And over this period of time, after Putin stepped in and after I was doing all these naming and shaming things, my portfolio went up to four and a half billion, from 100 million to four and a half billion, 45 times up. And I thought, this is pretty great. I mean, um, I, could, I could go after the bad guys and make money for my clients and myself, and um, it, how, this is just great. Um, and I wanted it to go on forever. Um, the problem is that um, Putin wasn't trying to clean up Russia. He was just going after his enemies. And he decided that he was going to end this whole enemy thing once and for all um, by arresting the richest man in Russia, a man named Mikhail Hordakovsky, the owner of Yukos. He arrests him off his private jet in Siberia. He brings him back to Moscow, puts him on trial, and allows the television cameras to film the richest man in Russia on trial sitting in a cage. He ends up sentencing him to 10 years in prison. And the other oligarchs who've seen this image of this guy far smarter, far more powerful than him, sitting in a cage and going off to prison for 10 years, they go to Putin and say, Vladimir, what do we have to do so we don't sit in a cage? Putin says, real simple, 50%. And that was the moment. This was um, the summer of 2004. Putin became the richest man in the world. And that was the moment that his interests and mine diverged. I carried on with my naming and shaming, but um, instead of going after his enemies, I was now going after his 50% economic interest. And um, they had to figure out what to do with me. And in November of 2005, I'd been living in Moscow for 10 years. I was the largest foreign investor in their country. Um, I, was, I, came, I was on a weekend trip to London. I flew back to Moscow. I arrived at Sheremetyevo Airport. And instead of letting me through, they arrested me. They kept me in the airport detention center for 15 hours. And then they deported me back to London and declared me a threat to national security not to be allowed into the country. Now, when, when the Russians turn on you, they don't tend to do so mildly. They usually do with extreme prejudice. And I said, where else am I exposed? Well, I've got a lot of money invested in the country, and I've got people working for me in the country. And so I evacuated all of my staff and all of their families 
And then once everyone was safe in London, we quickly and quietly liquidated every holding that we had in Russia and got all of our money out. And I thought that's, you know, phew. Um, that was a close call, but everybody's safe, our money is safe. Time to move on to other things. And I'm done with Russia. Well, it turns out that they were just getting started with me. Um, in uh, 18 months after I was expelled, in June, uh, June of 2007, I get a call from the one last person who I have in, in Russia. Um, it's a secretary who sits in the office by herself. And she calls me in hysterics because there's 25 police officers raiding our office in Moscow. Empty office, I should say. There's 25 more officers raiding the office of the American law firm that I used in Moscow. They were specifically looking for the stamps, seals, and certificates for our investment holding companies, companies through which we had invested all of our money in Russia, which were empty at this point, but they didn't know that. They found all these documents at the law firm's office. They take those documents, and the next thing we know, we no longer own our investment holding companies. Using the documents seized by the police, um, these companies were then fraudulently re-registered out of our name into the name of a man who, who was convicted of manslaughter and let out of jail early by the police, presumably to put his name on these documents. I was terrified that I was, that, you know, there's no financial risk to me, the money was safe, but I would be walking through Frankfurt Airport someday in the next year or two afterwards, and I'd be arrested on a Russian warrant. And so I go out and I find the smartest lawyer I know in Russia to help me figure out what's going on and to stop it. That lawyer's name was Sergei Magnitsky. He was 35 years old, he worked for an American law firm, and he was one of these super smart people who could run circles around everybody else. And I ask him to investigate and figure out what they're doing and how we can stop it. Sergei figures out, he goes around, investigates, does all the, all the work, and he comes back and he says, I figured out what they were trying to do. The first thing they wanted to do was to steal all of your money, but you got all your money out, so they didn't succeed. However, the second thing did work. And the second thing was that when I sold everything in the previous year after I was expelled, um, we had a huge profit. We had a billion dollars of profit. And we paid $230 million of capital gains tax to the Russian government on that profit. And what Sergei had figured out was the people who had stolen our companies went back to the tax authorities and they said, we want to file an amended tax return that these companies didn't earn a billion dollars, they earned zero. Therefore, um, the $230 million of taxes that was paid last year was paid by mistake. They applied for a $230 million illegal tax refund on the 23rd of December, 2007, two days before Christmas, and it was approved and paid out the next day, Christmas Eve. The lar it was the largest tax refund in the history of Russia, paid out in one day. Sergei and I were absolutely convinced that this must be a rogue operation. This wasn't my money that was being stolen. This was the Russian government's money that was being stolen. And so we, we thought, um, if we just bring this to the attention of the most important people in Russia, then the good guys will get the bad guys, and that will be the end of the story. And so um, we, wrote, he, we wrote criminal complaints to every different law enforcement agency, I went to the media, to the TV, radio, et cetera, and then Sergei gave sworn testimony against the police officers who conducted the raid um, that seized the, that, to seize the documents. Um, and we sat back and waited for the good guys to get the bad guys. Well, in um, Putin's Russia, there are no good guys. Five weeks after Sergei testified against the police officers who conducted the raid, um, the same police officers came to his home uh, <coughs> In, on the 24th of November, 2008, and arrested him, um, put him in pretrial detention, uh, where he was then tortured to withdraw his testimony. They put him in cells with 14 inmates and eight beds and left the lights on 24 hours a day to impose sleep deprivation. Uh, they put him in cells with um, no heat and no window panes in December in Moscow, so he nearly froze to death. They put him in cells with um, uh, no toilet, just a hole in the floor where the sewage would bubble up. They'd move him from cell to cell to cell. And the purpose of all this was they wanted to get him to withdraw his testimony 
against these corrupt police officers. And they wanted to get him to sign a false confession to say that he stole the $230 million, and he did so on my instruction. And Sergei was a man of incredible integrity, and for him, the idea of bearing false witness and perjuring himself was more awful than the physical pain they were subjecting him to, and he refused. And so the, as a result, the uh, pressure and the torture got worse and worse and worse. And after about six months of this, he started to have really terrible pains in his stomach. Um, he ended up losing 20 kilos, and he was diagnosed by the prison hospital as having pancreatitis and gallstones and needing an operation, which was scheduled for the 1st of August, 2009. A week before the operation, they come to him again, again ask him to sign a false confession. Again, he refuses. In retaliation, they move him from a prison that had a medical wing to a maximum security prison called Butyrka, which is considered to be one of the most horrific prisons in Russia. And most significantly for Sergei, there was no medical wing there, no place to treat his ailments. At Butyrka, his health goes into a terrible downward spiral. He's in constant agonizing pain. Um, he and his lawyers write 20 different desperate requests for medical attention to every different branch of the criminal justice system. Every one of their requests was either ignored or denied in writing. And on, on the night of November 16, 2009, Sergei Magnitsky went into critical condition. On that night, <clears throat> the uh, Butyrka authorities didn't want to have responsibility for him anymore. And so they um, put him in, in an ambulance and sent him across town to a different prison that had a medical wing. But when he got to that prison, instead of putting him in the emergency room, they put him in an isolation cell. They chained him to a bed. And eight riot guards with rubber batons came into that cell and beat Sergei Magnitsky until he died. That was November 16th, 2009, 15 years ago. Sergei Magnitsky was 37. Uh, he left a wife and two children. I got the news the very next morning, and it was the most horrifying, traumatic, life-changing news I could have ever gotten. Sergei Magnitsky was killed because he worked for me. He was killed because he was my lawyer. If he hadn't worked for me, he'd still be alive today. And when I was able to finally um, think clearly through the fog of heartbreak and hysteria, um, I made a vow to his memory, um, to his family, and to myself that I was going to put aside everything else I was doing in my life and devote all of my time, all of my energy, and all of my resources to go after the people who killed him to make sure that they face justice. And for the last 15 years, that's what I've been doing. Now, at first, I thought there was a chance that we would get justice in Russia. Sergei had written 450 criminal complaints during his 358 days in detention, documenting everything that happened to him up till the last night of his life. He would write them in the form of these criminal complaints. He, once a month, he'd hand a stack of them to his lawyers. His lawyer would file them. The Russian authorities would either ignore them or deny them. Um, but we got copies. And so we have the most, most well-documented case of human rights abuse that's come out of Russia ever. We publicized all of this. And I thought for sure that the Russian government would have to at least prosecute the executors of this murder. But they didn't. They circled the wagons. Putin got involved personally. Um, they gave pr promotions and state honors to some of the people most complicit. Putin exonerated every, every last person who was involved in this thing. And then they went on to prosecute Sergei Magnitsky and me. They prosecuted Sergei Magnitsky in the first ever prosecution against a dead man in the history of Russia. I was his co-defendant. Empty courtroom, three years after they killed him. They found us both guilty, of course. And so it became clear that there was no chance of getting justice in Russia. So we said, how do we get justice outside of Russia? And that's when I came up with an interesting idea, which is that the people who killed him, they did it for money. They don't keep that money in Russia. They keep that money in the West. And so the idea was, maybe we can't prosecute these people for torture and murder here in the UK or in the US, but we can freeze their assets and we can ban them from traveling here. And of course, they love traveling here. We've seen it with all the, all the um, Russians coming to the London and New York and so on. And so I took this idea to Washington, and I presented it to two senators, um, a Democratic senator from Maryland named Benjamin Cardin, a Republican senator from Arizona, 
the late John McCain. I told him the story that I've just shared with you tonight. And I said, can we freeze their assets and ban their visas? And these two senators said yes. And that became known as the Magnitsky Act. And the Magnitsky Act, and I should point out, this was at a time in Washington when there was no pro-Russian torture and murder lobby. There is now, and you can see it as you watch your TV with, with uh, what's, go what's going on in, in, in Washington. It went, when it went for a vote in the Senate, it passed 92 to 4. It passed the House of Representatives with 89%. And on December 14, 2012, President Obama signed the Magnitsky Act into law. And Putin went out of his mind. Putin went, he, he banned the adoption of Russian orphans by American families in retaliation. He, met, he announced that it was sing, his single largest foreign policy priority to repeal the Magnitsky Act. And then he started coming after me. Now, um, he was hoping that he would intimidate me, and he was hoping that he'd intimidate the United States, hopefully to repeal the Magnitsky Act. Neither happened. I then, uh, I then moved on to um, uh, Canada. In 2017, the Canadians passed the Magnitsky Act. Here in the UK in 2018, the UK passed the Magnitsky Act. In 2020, the EU passed the Magnitsky Act, 27 countries. In 2021, the Australians passed the Magnitsky Act. In between, we've got Iceland, Norway, Kosovo, Montenegro, and various other places. There's now 35 countries with Magnitsky Acts all over the world. I'll never be able to um, shed myself of the burden of guilt and responsibility that I have for Sergei Magnitsky's death, but I have made sure that his death wasn't a meaningless death, that his, um, that his death will hopefully protect, and I should point out that the Magnitsky Act doesn't just apply now to Russian human rights violators, it applies to human rights violators all over the world, in China and Iran and so on and so forth. And my hope is that, that his, his sacrifice, his death, will hopefully, through the Magnitsky Act, save many lives around the world. Thank you very much. Wow, so it's a very powerful story, as very powerful story as you can hear. Um, Sierra Malvika, do you want to kick off with some questions? Who wants to go first? No. Yeah, we maybe can. a little better here. <laughs> um, Bill, your I mean your story is just incredible, and I've read both your books, and they truly do read like spy novels, you know, you just sit down and you read them in one sitting. And I'm often finding myself asking, you know, how do you do it? And as we, you know, the Oxford community of MBAs and the broader school really grapple with the problems of injustice that we see from, you know, topics like digital colonialism, the environmental crisis, I often find myself wondering, you know, how do you maintain this resilience and consistency in your fight for this greater good? You know, it's, it's, um Hello, hello. <laughs> uh, I, I think, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a really important question because uh, when I set out for the, on this campaign for justice, uh, it, I had no expectation actually that, that we would get, I, I mean, to get, a, to get a, law, a US federal law passed is, is less probable than winning the lottery. Uh, I mean, it's really very, very unlikely. And, um, and I never expected that it would happen. And so the, the way that, and I think this is true with any major hard project, you don't look at the end, you, you have a direction you're going in, but you don't um, judge yourself on, on, that dire uh, on the, how, the, the progress you make towards that thing. You just judge yourself in very small incre increments. And so, you know, we get an article written about some important part of the process that, we, you know, that was a big success that day. We got an article in the New York Times or, I got a letter from a member of Congress to the State Department. That, that was a successful day with that, getting that letter. Or, you know, we found a piece of information which is truly damaging to the Russians' narrative. That was a great day. And it's kind of like climbing a mountain. You look up the mountain, it's just enormously high, and it looks impossible. 
And it's just like, you know, step by step, step by step. And we celebrated, at every, and celebrated our successes at every different step along the way. And that's how, how we were able to do it. I mean, I've been doing this for 15 years now. Um, but it's not like I'm an unhappy, you know, individual. I mean, I, you know, I, I feel every day a, a mission, a sense of mission and a sense of accomplishment. And I don't, and I don't berate myself when, it, when we, we haven't made progress towards the big thing because we look at these very small things. And that's, I think, an important life lesson, whether you're on a, you know, trying to stand up to the Russian government or whatever your project is. Uh, so in your book, you've spoken about the global financial system, governments, as well as the trust that we place in these systems. But what advice would you give us as students, MBA students, who are learning about global rules of the game and ethics in our MBA program? That how should we as future business leaders navigate this world where we trust them and at the same time play along the rules of the game? So... So one of the one of the really um, unpleasant discoveries that I've made in in the last fifteen years doing this is that all the institutions of the world that are set up with a purpose um, are not fit for that purpose, and so regulators don't regulate, police don't police, um, uh, uh, nothing works, absolutely nothing works, um, and and that means that you have to be very vigilant about whatever your interests are in how you're conducting yourself. You should expect that people, people tend to, be, to behave badly. Um, uh, people who are supposed to make them behave well don't. And so um, you kind of have to uh, approach things with, with a, a very um, uh, high, high level of alert um, so that you don't end up in a bad situation. And I, and I have to say that it's worse the further you get, you get away from what I call rule of law countries. Um, if you go to um, what they call emerging markets, the rule of law doesn't, doesn't exist the way it does here. It doesn't exist properly here either, but it, it's, you can't, you generally you can go to court if someone does something bad to you here. You go to China, um, some, if you get, someone rips you off, there's, you have no, you have no um, recourse. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, I, I think that, that you kind of have to be, you know, buyer beware, I would say, <laughs> In, in everything you do in life, because it's, it, the world is a pretty rough place. Thank you. Yeah, and I just, I just have one more question for you here. Um, and thinking about, like, going off Melvika's question about system change at a broader scale, and really just curious to learn a little bit more about where you see this project in maybe 20 or 30 years, or if you have a vision in mind for financial justice in Russia and beyond. Um, well, I, I'm, uh, so coming back to my analogy about the mountain, I, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm not looking out 20 or 30 years. I'm just looking out for what I'm going to do next week. And uh, uh, you know, I think we're, we're, we're in a world right now facing some really terrible um, issues. Of course, there's the Putin's murderous invasion of Ukraine. How does that resolve itself? Are the Ukrainians going to be able to get the money they need? <clears throat> That's a this week question. If they don't get the money they need, then the Russia will win. If, they, if Russia wins, then then Russia will be at the Estonian border next, and if they're, they're there, then there's NATO. Do we go and fight with Russia ourselves? And then you've got um, uh, the, the whole conflict in the Middle East. You've got um, uh, Hamas you know, with 130 hostages, Israeli hostages, innocent people, um, and, and all the terrible things going on with that. And then you've got China eyeing up Taiwan, where all the chips are manufactured. Um, uh, and that's not to mention that you have Donald Trump um, uh, who's leading in the polls right now. And so I can't even think beyond, you know, I'm just looking out two weeks right now and I'm scared. <laughs> Malvika, do you have one more? Yes, just the last one. So your story so far has been so courageous, but I'm sure there must be a time where you had to select or choose between your own personal danger and then trying to seek justice. So how would you balance the two or select between the two? Well, so, so um, many, many people, so the, the average person <clears throat> who saw the dilemma that I was in, um, uh, the best lawyers and advisors and friends and high level people said, Bill, keep your mouth shut, go to ground. Um, that's what I would do. Really like important people were telling me that. And, um, and that was the worst advice and the advice I didn't follow because 
the people who keep their mouth shut um, are the ones that they can kill easily. Um, the ones who, who uh, make a loud noise, like me, um, it it's, doesn't mean they're not going to try to kill me, but it means that, that it's a much higher cost operation. And so I, it's counterintuitive, but, but I have gone straight at them in as loud a way as possible, and I continue to do that. And, um, uh, and like, for example, I was arrested on a Russian uh, Interpol red notice in Madrid. I was going actually to visit the chief anti-corruption prosecutor of Spain about money connected to the Magnitsky murder going to Spain. He invited me to give sworn testimony, and as I was leaving, or as, as leaving, leaving my hotel for breakfast, there's two Spanish national police officers standing out my hotel door um, uh, there to arrest me on a Russian Interpol notice. Um, and the hotel manager was with them, and, and he, he negotiated feverishly with them to allow me to pack my stuff because he had given me a big upgrade, and he didn't want his room uh, occupied uh, <laughs> in, in sort of Ill, an undefined amount of time, and, and uh, whether I was going to pay for it or not. And, um, and so I, I was able to go into a room, and, had, and we had several rooms because it was all um, uh, upgraded. And I was able to, to go into Twitter, and, and I tweeted out, um, um, urgent being arrested in, uh, on a Russian Interpol warrant in Spain, not sure where they're taking me. And then um, and the police didn't take away my phone, and so they, they put me in the back of the police car. I took a picture of the back of their heads when they weren't looking and tweeted that out. And it got such an international... Uh, it, it must have been retweeted like, I don't know, 15,000 times. And all journalists and politicians were calling Interpol and calling the Spanish police and calling everywhere. That by the time, and they put me in the, in the cell, but like an hour and a half later, it was, it was such a, sh uh, a shock to the whole world that they ended up releasing me. And if I hadn't been doing that, that, that wouldn't have happened. And so, um, so the, the sort of, the idea that you want, that, that so, to sort of go against what, what, what would be the natural reaction, which is just keep your head down, I think that actually, in a certain way, has kept me safer. Thank you. Right, questions from the audience. Um, please put your hand up, and when the um, microphones are here, so please grab a microphone, and when you um, ask a question, please state your name, and um, if it's appropriate, say you're an MBA student or something else. Uh, so maybe here. Um, uh, there and there w with the red. So one, two, three. Thank you. Um, a question is, how do you think Vladimir Putin regards himself? Is he Peter the Great or just a criminal? So um, thank you for that question. Uh, it's a really excellent question. Um, most people over, overstate his um, power and his his, what, what he's all about. Um, uh, and, and, and by the way, he, he, he tries to come up with a narrative to give people the, this big impression of him. In Russia, it's very simple. Nobody goes into public service for any other reason than to steal money. If you're a traffic policeman, you stop the cars and you extract bribes. If you're a junior minister, you, know, you, you uh, issue regulations in exchange for money. And as you work your way up to the president, the more money, you, the higher you up, the more money you get. Putin has stolen a lot of money. That's what he's done. Um, between Putin and a thousand people around him, since he came to power, they've stolen a trillion dollars from the Russian state. A trillion dollars. And I don't make this up. But it's a it's a real number based on analysis. And um, and when you steal that much money. Um, that's money that should have been spent on hospitals and schools and roads. Instead, it was spent on yachts and private jets and villas. And that creates a terrible, brittle, dangerous situation, which, you know, one match and the whole thing could go up, catch on fire. And Putin has put himself in a position. He's created so much misery, so many deaths, and so much, committed so many crimes to steal that money that if he's ever not in power, he loses the money, he goes to jail, and he dies. So if you're a, um, uh, a, and he's a small, physically small man. So if you're a physically small man, you've stolen too much money, you're desperately afraid of your people rising up against you, what do you do? Um, you create a foreign enemy, and you start a war, and you distract them from the anger that they legitimately should have towards you. 
And that's simply why he's done this. The, and he's, he's not in Ukraine because he has some grand vision of, of a Russian empire. That, those are his words, but that's not what he's up to. That's not what he's about. He's just a scared little man desperately trying to stay alive. That's Putin. Um, here. And if we maybe give the next microphone to the um, gentleman there in the red top. Oh, hi, Bill. Thanks very much. I'm a, a current MBA student here. Um, your, your story is really, uh, it sounds like a story of the collective West standing up and, and sort of battling the injustice with Russia. And, and you sort of mentioned there that there's a bit of a debate right now of whether the U.S. is going to continue funding the, the crisis. Well, it's very interesting. The, um, uh, so the, the, the answer is no. Um, the, I mean, there's, there's, so there's definitely fatigue. It's, not, it's no longer interesting to turn your television on and watch another neighborhood in Ukraine being terrorized by Russian missile. That, that's, people have lost interest in that. But in the halls of power, the people who are making decisions in Europe, in the United States, and here in the UK, there's, there's no lack of interest in Ukraine and in supporting Ukraine. Um, what Putin has done, though, is he's very good at dividing and conquering and finding little, little, little wedges. And so he found a wedge in Europe uh, that worked for a couple months. He found Europe, all Europe policy is dependent on 27 countries um, agreeing on a, on a foreign policy decision. Um, it's, it requires 100% consensus, every, every foreign policy decision. And he found one country, uh, Hungary, run by Viktor Orban, uh, and he got Hungary to veto 50 billion euros of uh, aid to Ukraine. Hungary makes up 2% of the population of Europe, but he was able to get that country because of, of, a, of a corrupt relationship he has with the, with the um, prime minister of Hungary um, to stop $50 billion from coming. Eventually, Europe understood that, that they, they, that they got to do some serious like, hardball, and they, they said to Hungary, we're going to stop funding you, and we're going to take away your voting rights, and, um, and you, you know, really bad stuff will happen, and Hungary buckled. Orban buckled, I should say. Same thing is going on in the U.S. right now. Um, I, I, I know many senators and, and representatives, they all support Ukraine. Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, was given his slot by Trump, and Trump wants him to not put on, and he's, he's individually able to decide what gets voted on in the House of Representatives. And he said, we're not going to vote on, on uh, Ukraine. Um, I don't think that that's going to ultimately succeed. I think that uh, my prediction is that over the next weeks, um, the US will eventually free up that money. Um, but we have a big, bigger problem which is that in, in November, there's an election. And Trump is leading in the polls. And Trump has been very explicit that he doesn't want to fund Ukraine. And if America doesn't fund Ukraine, then Europe has to, basically, America is responsible for half, half of all the money going to Ukraine. So Europe will have to double the expenditure to keep it at the same level. Will Europe do that? I don't know. If it doesn't, then Russia could win in Ukraine. And if Russia wins in Ukraine, then there's all sorts of other terrible stuff. So it's a pretty worrying situation in the medium term, I think in the short term, we're probably okay. Hi, uh, my name's Tony. I'm from the uh, economics and management school, so I have a six year. Um, my question's sort of, you sort of answered it um, in your previous response, but I was wondering what your analysis of the current state of the Ukraine war is. For example, what do you think about Putin's true motivations and what those in the circles around him are thinking? And I was also wondering what you think the most I ideal or most realistic solution is to that conflict, and also what you think will change uh, if Trump's elected instead of Biden. Thank you. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you can only have one. But so, so um, really, really important point <clears throat> that everybody should know uh, is that Putin will not negotiate any kind of peace. So for the same reason that Putin went into Ukraine to stay in power, any kind of compromise, peace treaty negotiation is a demonstration of weakness in the Russian mind. And any, any expression of weakness 
will lead to Putin's downfall. And so there is no chance that Putin will negotiate anything. And this is a, there's a fantasy in the West that somehow there a peace deal could be done. And, and there's all sorts of people saying, well, well we should give peace a chance. Um, Putin is not, Putin is the invader, and he has no intention of uninvading or stopping the invasion. And, the, and on the Ukrainian side, if the Ukrainians were in any way to capitulate, then any part of their territory where they capitulate, the, the people of that territory, the women get raped, the men get tortured, and the children get kidnapped. And so if you're a Ukrainian, you've got a pretty strong incentive to continue fighting under any circumstances. And so my first prediction is that the war is going to continue for a long time. And so how do you resolve this? There's one simple way to resolve it, which is to give the Ukrainians the equipment that they've asked for, that they need, to fight, out the, fight off and expel the Russians. And they've, and they've asked for it, and it's not that complicated. Um, and in, we in the West have explicitly given them enough equipment so they don't lose. But we've held back giving them enough equipment so they win. And the reason that we're afraid of them winning is that there's a fear, if they win, what happens next? And, and so my, my prediction is that, that um, this, is this war, in, however, in whatever uh, context, is going to go on for a long time. Um, and if Trump gets in, then it changes the whole complexion of it. But at the end of the day, um, Ukrainians aren't going to give up, and Putin's not going to give up. Okay. Um, uh, we'll, we'll take some more questions from the audience in just a second. Uh, I've got some questions from the online audience. So I'm going to read, I'm going to give um, you three questions at one go. And you, okay. can, uh, and you can answer them how you wish. The first is, has Magnitsky, in your view, achieved its purpose? The act. Um, secondly, uh, you have um, tweeted, apparently, that uh, China is a ruthless dictatorship. Do you believe that China is uninvestable? <laughs> as a result. <laughs> and the third is, um, which countries do you see near-term opportunities to the ones you encountered in Russia 20 years ago? That's definitely, <laughs> a, business, uh, that's definitely a business school question. Yeah. I, I always get that question. Everyone, you know, they hear about the 4,500% return and they want, they want to uh, get in on the action. <laughs> um, well, uh, let me answer the last one first and then we'll t talk about the other ones. The... Um, uh, it is really um, uh, rule of law, I've learned. So why was Russia so cheap um, when I first got there? It was a 99.7% discount. The reason it was so cheap was because there was no rule of law, no property rights. And so um, I, 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 um, that, it was kind of great speculation when I did it, but I, you, know, you don't want to do that kind of stuff. And, um, and so I have all of my investments now are, are in places where there's a rule of law and property rights. And so and when you go into those places, you're not going to find these types of valuations. Um, and, um, uh, and actually, as it relates to China, China doesn't have a rule of law or property rights. Um, you know, chi China's got, had, doesn't have any more, had great economic growth um, and had some industrial policy, which moving people from rural to cities and so on and so forth, which created some wealth over a period of time. But if you're an investor in China and someone rips you off, there's nothing you can do. There's no court you can go to. There's no, you can't go to the newspapers. There's no free press. There's no politician that you can go to. If, you, if someone rips you off, and, and the whole nature of investment is you put money in up front, you take a risk, and then something happens later on, either good or bad, hopefully good. And if later on, when the good things start to happen, people say, well, actually, I want some of that, um, there's nothing you can do. And there's a huge incentive for people to say, I want some of that once, you, once the good things start happening. And so um, in my mind, China is totally uninvestable. And, um, and we're seeing that, by the way, um, uh, with the performance of, of Chinese investments. You know, it's, um, it's very interesting if you look at there, there are these closed-end um, investment trusts that trade on the London Stock Exchange, which are, um, uh, and the ones that are invested in like Carlyle and KKR, where they have like an investment trust that invests in like U.S. private equity funds, they maybe trade at a 20% discount because there's a discount on all these closed-end funds. The, um, the ones that trade, that, that invest in, in Chinese venture capital trade at an 80 or 90% discount to their NAV. 
And of course, we've seen what happens, what's happening in the Chinese stock market right now. Um, it's, not a good, it's just not good business to be investing in places, in authoritarian dictatorships where there's no rule of law. And on the very first question, has the Magnitsky achieved its objectives? The Magnitsky Act has gone so far beyond anything I could have ever imagined, it's unbelievable. There, there are now, as I mentioned, 35 countries that have Magnitsky Acts. Um, it, is, it, is a, um, uh, it, it applies to d everyone everywhere. And so there, there are people on the Magnitsky list that, did, that, that shot students in Nicaragua. There are people organizing the Uyghur concentration camps in Xinjiang that are on the Magnitsky list. There are people involved in the Rohingya genocide uh, in Myanmar. Um, there are Iranians, there are Venezuelans. Um, and what's happened is that everybody who's ever been victimized now has something, something they can call on, something they can do, some, some way of advocating. And so there's now groups all over the world, NGOs and, and, and other charities that are now putting in Magnitsky sanctions designation applications for victims all over the place. And it's turned into this remarkable, unbelievable thing. And most importantly, and this is something that I couldn't have ever imagined, that, that the idea that individual sanctions, going after individuals, freezing individuals' assets, seems kind of obvious, but they never did that before. The sanctions were always against countries. And um, going after individuals is, is, um, is, is far more powerful than going after a country. And you go after a country, and, and the heads of the, the leaders can bring in private jets with their champagne and caviar. But, you, but if you go after the leaders directly and freeze their offshore assets, that is a really, it hits them hard right between the eyes. And, and, um, and, and once, that, once this was debated in the US and in the EU on Magnitsky, um, when the war started, when Putin invaded Ukraine, nobody had to debate anything. We already had the template, the Magnitsky template. And that's one of the first things they used. And they've got like more than 2,000 people sanctioned in Russia. And it's messed up. Putin and the oligarchs in all sorts of interesting ways. And so it's, gotten, it's been a huge, a hugely influential beyond anything I could have ever predicted or imagined. Right, we'll take a clutch of questions. So this lady here in there, um, we'll go up to the gentleman there with the blue, and then over there uh, to that side, you there behind Professor Morrison. So. Hi, I'm doing MSc in Russian and European studies, so it's slightly different angle. Um, there's lots of discussions at the moment about how we invest in Ukraine after the war, what a victorious Ukraine will look like. Do you think it's a problem that we're not having the same conversations about prospects for a defeated Russia? Um, <laughs> 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 well, I, I, um, uh, I mean, I, I, it all depends on what a defeat, well, l l I mean, that's a very optimistic question because that, that, that assumes that we're going to defeat Russia. Um, I mean, if Russia is defeated, I think it, it's incumbent upon us to do what we did with Germany and Japan, um, which is to create a Marshall Plan so that um, uh, you know, the right institutions are, are created and the right financial support is created so that there's a proper, so it can function as an, integ as an integrated part of the world. Um, and, and it's very interesting because one of the big things that I've been working on in the last two years has been uh, confiscating the, um, there's been about $350 billion of Russian central bank reserves that were frozen at the very beginning of the war. And, um, and, it, and it seems to me that that money shouldn't just be frozen, it should be confiscated. And the original idea that was going around was to confiscate it um, for the rebuilding of Ukraine. Um, but now that money is running out, I think you need to confiscate it for the defense of Ukraine because coming to your, the assumption in your question, which is that there's a defeated Russia, um, uh, we could end up with a defeated Ukraine if they run out of money. And so it's, um, I think we have, I think it's, we have, the, the, your question is a high class problem. We have, we've got to get to there first. Um, so either that gentleman there, um, so if, if there's a microphone that can go to the man there, who has his hand up. One of you had your hand up, no? And then to this gentleman here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Tomas, I'm a current MBA student. Uh, I just wanted to ask, beyond going after individuals, uh, have you seen or what do you think are the best mechanisms to go after cor corruption in a general level? There's a lot of countries that just, it's the way they operate, even if they're not uh, oligarchies or dictatorships. What? What have you seen, or what do you think is the most effective way to just combat corruption? 
Well, the, um, uh, I think that, that the only way that people choose not to be corrupt is if the um, consequences of corruption are um, more worrying than the um, benefits of corruption. And one of the things that's, you know, so we have, like, the U.S. has the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Um, and so U.S. companies don't participate in bribery because if people working in, for, in U.S. companies don't want to go to jail. And they have the Bribery Act here. Um, but there's very, very um, lax enforcement in different places and so on and so forth. And so, for example, we were investigating the money laundering that was connected to the um, murder of Sergei Magnitsky, connected to the $230 million. And one of the things, and we found a lot of the money, and we then would write, to, write letters to the prosecutor of every country where we found the money. We found it in 26 countries. Wrote 26 criminal complaints. 16 countries opened criminal investigations, including the United States, um, France, Switzerland, Spain. But, but the largest recipient of all the, the dirty money from the Magnitsky murder was the United Kingdom. And in this country, we wrote, I think, a total of eight criminal complaints, and we were never able to get the UK authorities to open a criminal investigation. And I was feeling really upset by this, um, uh, and, I, and, I, and I took it personally, until I discovered that since Putin came to power, there hasn't been a single um, money laundering uh, financial crimes prosecution against a Russian in this country. And so what does that do? That means that Russians, and it also means Jewish people who were enabling the money laundering, um, had an incentive to do it, and there's no disincentive. Um, and so I think that, that the way to combat corruption is to enforce the laws, starting with our countries and making it painful um, so that, at least in the West, we don't become enablers for the corruption that's going on in, in, in emerging markets. Um, and, I, and this country has a lot to answer for. First of all, thank you so much, Bill, for being here. Your speech was uh, very inspiring. And when you were speaking about Russia, kind of make me think a little bit about my country. I'm Brazilian, I'm a Brazilian lawyer, and it's also a country that does not have a lot of rule of law. It corrupt politicians and public officials from uh, head to toe. I received death threats due to my work as a lawyer in Brazil and so on and so forth. So I could kind of like relate to that. And um, what I wanted to ask you specifically, it's oh, the first thing is, you mentioned that China, for example, is an investable country, uh, and I guess that Brazil would be reasonably close to that considering what I, what I know of the country. And I also believe that there are many other investors who see it the same way. So what would a country have to do to prove to international investors that it is not an investable? How uh, can a country prove that it has rule of law? Is it the general opinion? Is it like a media uh, campaign or, or what? How could that go? That would be my first question. Uh, my second question is, how is the procedure to add someone to the Magnitsky list? Not like specifically as in you file a complaint to the United States government or whatever, uh, as in the sense of how political is that? You need support from senators, Democrats, Republicans, bipartisan. Uh, what is the, the, the background to it? And my third and very small question is just a small curiosity. You mentioned you were in Aspen when Donald Trump said that it would be a good deal. Uh, why didn't you get out of the United States right away? <laughs> um, so I, the reason I didn't leave Aspen right away is, is um, uh, I, I didn't think that they were going to be that efficient. Um, <laughs> And a very interesting thing happened when, when, with, the, with this thing, was, which is that, so there's this summit. Every camera in the whole world was focused on these two individuals. And um, Putin asked for me to be handed over. And all of a sudden, the entire press community of the world wants to know who is Bill Browder and what is the Magnitsky Act. And so I thought, this is a great opportunity to tell everybody that. And so I spent the next four days in, in television studios doing that. And, and, and I was able to, in many ways, the, the, one, of the, one of the reasons the Magnitsky Act has been so successful is that um, Trump made me for a brief period of, you know, I had, I had my 15 minutes of fame, and I was able to use that to parlay that um, and into something bigger. Um, uh, what, to make some a country investable, you need something very simple, which is you need to have independent courts, judges that are not. Um, you, need, you need a rule of law, and, and the, what, what that means is that, you know, if you have a dispute, you can go in front of a judge. 
and the judge isn't bribed, and the judge will adjudicate uh, a conflict on the basis of law. And, um, and ideally, you would also have institutions, like government institutions, that regulate things and, again, aren't bribed. And, and, aren't, and, and, and that's not a matter of public relations. That's, that's a matter of, of um, uh, that's just a matter of, of substance. And it's, it's a very uncomfortable thing for most countries to have. If you're, if, you're, uh, if you're a leader in a country, even a good country, you kind of don't want to have a rule of law because you'd want to just do whatever you want to do. And it makes life a lot easier if you're a um, uh, president or a prime minister not to have a rule of law. Um, and if you have a rule of law, there's a good chance or you know, people will come, you, know, you could be prosecuted or someone else could be prosecuted if you do something bad. And a lot of people do stuff that's bad. And so um, it's kind of hard to, um, I mean, I don't know how, how, how is, I mean, this country has got a pretty good rule of law. Um, you know, if you go to an, an, uh, like a plan, uh, if you go to a, a, a planning office in a British city, they're not taking bribes to like convert farmland to shopping malls. Um, they're just not. I don't know why they don't. It's a cultural thing as well as as a, uh, uh, but they don't. And it's just it's remarkable that that you can have a culture of, of like appropriateness in some ways, and, and then you have a culture of inappropriateness in the fact that that um, that there's no prosecutions in this country. And so it, it's, it's, it's sort of hard to, to put, your, put, put one's finger on it. Um, on the Magnitsky Act itself, how do you get somebody on the list? Um, one, one of the great myths that, um, that, that I, I enjoy is that all sorts of bad guys think that I, have, that I, I somehow, I, I'm the guy who can get people, I can just make a call and get somebody on the list. <laughs> yeah, um, I remember a, after um, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi um, uh, by the Saudis, um, I started getting these weird telephone calls from people I knew who were friends with Saudis who were worried about getting on the list, seeing if they could somehow talk to me to make sure they don't get on the list. <laughs> um, the, the way it works is, is, is it's hard to get people on the Magnitsky list. You've got to be really, it's, there, nobody, there's not a single person on the Magnitsky list that shouldn't be on the Magnitsky list. The Magnitsky list, it's really low-hanging fruit of bad guys. There's a lot more bad guys than there are people on the Magnitsky list um, because it's so hard. And it's not a political thing. I mean, it's a political thing, but it's not a political thing. It doesn't matter how many senators write to say someone should be put on the list. Um, it's the State Department and the Treasury Department that make the decision, and they'll make the decision based on, on priorities. Like if there's you know, something going, really bad going on in a certain country and they want to make a point, they will put the, the most egregious offenders of that, area, of that thing on the, on the Magnitsky list. It's a pretty interesting rogues gallery. It's worth actually clicking onto it and just seeing who's there because um, you kind of get a sense for, for how egregious the, the people are who have made it onto the Magnitsky list. So we're out of time, but before we go, there's one question from, the, uh, from online, um, uh, from the audience um, watching, which is worth asking, which is, um, what has become of Sergei's family? Well, that's, a, that's the most important question, which is what this is all about. And um, uh, so his widow and his son um, were originally trying to stay in Russia after the, um, after the whole thing happened. Um, his widow didn't want to, um, uh, any more trauma for the, for the, at the time his son Nikita was eight years old and um, she was trying to create some stability for him and, and then they went after her in Russia. During that trial that I was telling you about, the, uh, where they put Sergei on trial, um, they needed somebody to sit in the defense seat and so they wanted to make her um, the legal representative of the defendant and have her effectively on trial for, for Sergei's trumped up crimes. And, uh, and she refused and, and they kept on summoning her and they said they were gonna arrest her and, and I finally was able to convince her to leave. I, I, I'd been begging her to leave from the day one. And so she left, she came here to the UK with, with Nikita. Um, we got him into a school, I supported them um, he graduated, uh, and, and he wants to become a... Uh, <laughs> actually, I'll tell you a funny story because it was a nice way to end the discussion. I had this fantasy that, um, of sending him to Harvard. Um, I really wanted him to go to Harvard. Um, and, um, and so I said uh, he was in, you know, in, the, in his junior year and get, getting, leading up to... And, and we got the whole... I got my whole office involved in his Harvard application. And... and <laughs> And we were going to like just come up with the best ideas. And he had a great, great grades and a smart kid. And he was a, had a great story, of course. And um, uh, 
and we were, it was like two weeks before the um, essays were due and, and we were all gonna have like all the great minds of my firm in the office on the Sunday and everyone was waiting for this big brainstorming session and um, he pulls me aside and, 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 uh, and he says, um, Bill, uh, actually he said Mr. Browder, um, uh, w what if I don't wanna go to Harvard? <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, where do you wanna go? And he said, I wanna do art. And I said, well, I'm sure they've got an art department at Harvard. <laughs> and, and he said, no, 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 I, I, I want to, I, I specifically, I want to do graphic art, and I, wanna, and, and I know where I want to go. There's a place in California that does it. And I, and I said, how can I, um, of course. <laughs> I said, this is my fantasy, not, not yours. Uh, and, so we, uh, and, and, made it, and so we didn't have to write all these <laughs> applications. <laughs> He got into the school in California. He's there, he's an artist. He's finishing up next year. Um, his mother is out there with him. They're in sunny California, far away from all this trouble, and he's pursuing his dreams.